Hi everyone, this is Mrs. GA, and today we're going to talk about transformations of quadratic functions. But first, please pause the video and give this warm up a try. All right, go ahead and take a look. So again, we were plugging these x values into the function x squared to get these y values. And when you plot them, um, this is what the parent function of our quadratic function family looks like. So every time we start talking about a new type of function, we will always start by looking at the parent function. Okay, so here is another graph um, of our parent function, p of x equals x squared. So I do want to talk about some of the key features of this parent function before we move on to transformations. Um, so our domain, well you can see the arrows on your graph suggesting it goes to the right and left forever. Our domain should always be all real numbers for these types of functions, but our range will be restricted. You can see that our graph physically stops and turns around. So the y values that are included are everything 0 and greater, so 0 to infinity. You can see that our graph is increasing to the right of our uh, vertex. This is called the vertex, which is at the origin, so 0 to infinity, and it's decreasing to the left of that vertex, so negative infinity to 0. For the end behavior, you can see that on both sides, our graph is going to point up. So I'm going to say as x approaches positive or negative infinity, f of x approaches positive infinity. Then again, our vertex is 0, 0. The vertex of our uh, parabola is going to be where our graph changes from decreasing to increasing or vice versa. And again, I just want to write this down. These types of graphs, we call them parabolas. Now, um, parabolas have what is called an axis of symmetry. You might have noticed that if I folded my um, graph on the y-axis right here, this half of the graph would match this half of the graph because it's symmetrical over that line. So um, we have what's called an axis of symmetry, which is a vertical line that will always go through our vertex. And we can use that symmetry to help us graph. So for our parent function, it's x equals 0, but it's always going to go through the x value of our vertex. And since it's a vertical line, we write the equation like this, x equals. Um, the last thing I want to talk about briefly, and I'll return to it later, is this vertical growth pattern that these types of functions follow. So I'm going to look at the um, change in the vertical height, the change in the y values between each of these coordinates. So you'll notice that I'm just going one unit to the right. So I have 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 9, and then we can even look at 4, 16. So let's look at the vertical distance between our first two coordinates. This vertical distance is 1. Now let's look at the distance between the next two coordinates, here to here. I'm adding 3 to the y value. Okay, to the next one, I'm adding 5. To the next one, I'm adding 7. So you may see a pattern forming here. So each coordinate to the right, I'm going to increase uh, my y value according to this pattern. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, so on and so forth. Um, so I call this a vertical growth pattern. So I'll say 1, 3, 5, 7, dot, dot, dot. Um, and we can use this to help us graph. And it's kind of a quick and easy way to get accurate points um, to one side of your uh, vertex. And then all you need to do is reflect those points over the axis of symmetry. So it's a really efficient um, thing that we can do to help us graph accurately. All right, so now let's move on to talking about um, transformations of our quadratic functions. Um, so these are the same transformations that we've been talking about since the beginning of the chapter. Um, so we have those vertical stretches and shrinks by a factor of a, and that's when you're multiplying the entire function by a. And remember, if a is greater than 1, we call it a stretch. Oops. So if a is greater than 1, it's a stretch, and if a is between 0 and 1, we call it a shrink. And notice that a is always positive. We also will have our horizontal translations, left h unit. So remember, if we add h, it actually shifts to the left, and if we subtract h, it actually shifts to the right. 
Now, if you look at where those values are added and subtracted, please note that they are specifically grouped with x, so they're actually part of the stuff that's being squared. So that's how we know it's a horizontal translation because it is specifically affecting x. And again, it is part of what is being squared. Now, if you compare that to the vertical translations, you can see that here we're adding or subtracting k after the x squared. Um, so here, if we add k, it shifts up k, and if we subtract k, it shifts down. And then we will also sometimes see negatives out front, so we're multiplying our entire function by negative 1, so that reflects over the x-axis. So maybe you're wondering, well, why did I leave out horizontal stretches or shrinks um, from this table? So you, you might see what would appear to be a horizontal stretch or shrink, something like this. I'm specifically multiplying the two. And we could actually treat it as a horizontal, this would be a horizontal shrink by a factor of one half. However, with quadratic functions, it's actually gonna be easier for us to simplify this and just turn it into a vertical stretch or shrink. So what I mean by that is this is 2x squared, which means the two is being squared and the x is being squared. So I can actually just square the two and rewrite this as 4x squared. So it goes from a horizontal shrink by a factor of 1 half to a vertical stretch by a factor of 4. So whenever I see this, I'm always going to rewrite it like this. And then you also maybe you're wondering, well, why don't we see reflections over the y-axis, which is, again, when we specifically multiply the x by negative 1. We're going to do the same thing that we did up here. If you ever see something like this, we can simplify it. So we know that negative 1 squared is actually just positive 1. So it turns out that because of the shape of our graph, if you think about our parabola, here's what our parent function looks like, right? And here's the x and y axis. So if you take our parent function and you reflect it over the y axis, so imagine I do that, we get the same exact graph. So with this type of function, um, a reflection over the y-axis doesn't affect our graph, so writing it, an equation like this and this are exactly the same. So again, whenever I see this, I am going to simplify my function before I start graphing. All right, let's try one of these together. Um, so here we're going to use transformations to transform the coordinates from our parent function. Um, so here's our function f of x. We know the parent function is just x squared. So here I just have five points we're going to be working with. So here's the points from my parent function. Now let's describe the transformations we see and write some rules for our coordinates. So that three out front would be a vertical stretch by a factor of three. And then that seven, again, it's not specifically grouped with x. So that's going to be a vertical translation down 7. So um, you'll notice that both of these transformations are vertical, which means there are no horizontal transformations. So our x values are going to stay exactly the same. And then for our y values, I'm going to multiply them by 3 and then subtract 7. All right, so here I would do th uh, 3 times 4, 12 minus 7, which is 5. And then here I have 3 times 1 minus 7, which is negative 4. 3 times 0 minus 7. And then these should be the same. And then all we need to do is plot our points. So we have negative 2, 5. Negative 1, negative 4. 0, negative 7. 1, negative 4. And 2, 5. So it's pretty narrow graph because of that vertical stretch. It looks like this. And you could see that if you think about where our parent function was, it's definitely been um, shifted down 7. All right, let's try another one together. Um, so first, uh, let's describe the transformations that we see. I see a negative that's out front. It's not specifically to x. So this is a vertical transformation, and it causes a reflection over the x-axis. And then here I can see that I'm adding 3 specifically to x. It's even grouped inside the parentheses of things that are being squared. So I know this is a horizontal translation. 
And remember, those will always move in the opposite direction. So even though it is plus 3, this will actually move our graph to the left 3. So to do these changes, well, let's start with our parent function coordinates. Remember, our parent function is x squared. So we have 4, 1, 0, 1, 4. Um, so for our x values, if I want to shift a coordinate to the left 3, I'm going to subtract 3. I understand that the equation says plus 3, but we have to actually look at what's physically happening to our graph. And then for our reflection, I would simply multiply my y values by negative 1. Okay, let's transform our coordinates. So negative 2 minus 3, we have negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, and then negative 2 and negative 1. And then for our y values, we just make all of them opposite. So negative 4, negative 1, 0, negative 1, and negative 4. So now we can plot our points and see what our parabola looks like. So we have negative 5, negative 4, negative 4, negative 1, negative 3, 0, negative 2, negative 1, and negative 1, negative 4. And there we go. So you can see that we're using that same method of transforming coordinates that we talked about um, previously in the chapter. All right, now I'm going to ask you to pause the video and give this one a try on your own. All right, go ahead and check your work here. Um, so we have three vertical transformations, a reflection over the x-axis, a vertical stretch by a factor of 3, and the vertical translation up 9. So you can see we have negative 3y plus 9, and then we have one horizontal transformation. That would be the horizontal translation to the right 2. So I'm actually going to add 2 to my parent function coordinates. Um, so here's my transform coordinates, and it gives me a downward-facing parabola um, that looks like this. So while understanding the process of graphing the transformations is super important, there are definitely more efficient ways to graph quadratics. So today um, we're going to talk about how to graph a quadratic function that is in a specific form, and this is called vertex form. So vertex form looks like this. It's y equals a times x minus h squared plus k. So if your function is in vertex form, we call it this form because it's really easy to see the vertex. The vertex is simply going to be h, k. Now notice here that in the equation this says x minus h, but here it says positive h. So what you see here and what you see here should always be opposite. But here it says plus k and it says positive k, so these will always be the same. Um, so we'll start by plotting our vertex, and then we're going to use our vertical growth pattern to help us plot additional points to the right and left. Now, the vertical growth pattern we know is 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, etc., but we will need to adjust that if we have some type of vertical stretch or shrink. So all you have to do is multiply your a value by that pattern, and then you can follow that adjusted pattern instead. All right, let's give one of these a try together. Um, so here we do have an equation in vertex form. So I can see that my vertex should be at positive 1, negative 5. So let's start by plotting that point. Okay, now let's look at our vertical growth pattern. So remember, we're going to do our a value times 1, 3, 5 to adjust our growth pattern for any vertical stretch or shrink. So instead of growing 1, 3, 5, our graph is actually going to grow at a rate of 2, 6, 10. I multiplied my pattern by 2. So how do I actually apply this to my graph? I start at my vertex, and then I start by going up 2 units, and it's always to the right 1. So I go up 2 units, right 1 unit, and I plot a point. Then from that point, I'm going to go up 6 units, 2, 4, 6, and to the right 1, and I plot that point. And then if you have space on your graph, from that point you could go up 10 units and to the right another 1. So here we have three more accurate points, pretty quickly just following our pattern to 
6, 10. Now, from here, if we use our axis of symmetry, we can actually plot points on the other side very quickly. So I can see that my axis of symmetry would be right here. It's not physically a part of our graph, which is why I graph with a dotted line. So this, this coordinate is one unit from our axis of symmetry, so I'm just going to move it one unit to the other side. Same thing here. This is two units, so I'm going to move it two units to the other side. My last point is three units to the right, so I'll go three units to the left. And we have a very quick and accurate graph. So as long as you remember to adjust your vertical growth pattern for any A value, um, I think this is a really great way to um, get additional points for your graph. All right, last is domain and range. We know for these functions, the domain should always be all real numbers. You can plug, plug any x value into a quadratic function and it should always give you a real number. Now for your range, our range has been shifted down with the rest of our graph. So I can see that my lowest y value is negative five and my highest y value would be infinity. So negative five to infinity. All right, let's try another one together. So let's start with our vertex. This is in vertex form. So I can see that my h value is actually negative four and my k value is three. So that's my vertex, negative four, three. And here, um, not only do I have a horizontal shrink by a factor of one half, but I also have that reflection. So I can actually multiply my growth pattern by negative one half, so one, three, five, seven, nine. I might actually extend out this pattern a little bit. So we have negative one half, negative three halves, negative five halves, negative seven halves, negative nine halves, and we can continue the pattern as much as we want. So that negative out front is going to make our graph a downward facing graph, so like a sad face rather than a happy face, and that's what you should always see when you have that, a, uh, that negative in front of your A value. Okay, so let's plot our additional points. I'm gonna go to my vertex, and I'm gonna go down half a unit to the right one. So I'm gonna estimate that point. From there, I'm gonna go down three halves to the right one. So there I actually have another exact coordinate that I can see. And then from there, I can go down five halves to the right one. And then from there, I can go down seven halves. And I could continue on, but I think this is plenty of exact coordinates. And then I'm simply going to reflect those coordinates to the other side of my axis of symmetry. Um, I do want to point out that an additional way that we could always find x coordinates or additional coordinates to the right or left of your vertex, you could always make a table of values. Just start plugging in numbers. Plug in negative three, plug in negative two, plug in negative one, plug in negative five, negative six, negative seven. So you can always find additional coordinates by simply plugging in values and making a table of values. I just think using that vertical growth pattern is a little bit quicker um, and can save us some time. All right, again, our domain should always be all real numbers, and we can see that now our range, well, the low value is negative infinity because it's going down forever, and then our highest y value is now positive three. So you can see that our range will always include that y value of your vertex. It's always, the vertex is always gonna be either your high point or, or the low point of your graph, the maximum or the minimum. All right, now I have one for you to try on your own, so please pause the video and give it a shot. All right, go ahead and check your work here. First, make sure you do have the correct uh, vertex. It is negative seven, negative one. And our growth pattern, we can adjust it for that reflection. So it's down one, down three, down five, giving us nice exact coordinates, and I reflected it. Domain is all real numbers, and the range is negative infinity to negative one. All right, I have another one for you to try on your own, so again, please pause the video. Go ahead and check your work here. 
So here you might have noticed that there's nothing being added or subtracted from x. So in this case, our h value is simply 0. We do have a k value out here, so our vertex is 0, 2. So it's completely fine for either part of your vertex to be 0. And then my vertical growth pattern you can see is up 3, up 9, and then up 15. Um, I just graphed what fit on our graph comfortably, and then here you can see our domain and range. Okay, so now we're going to do the opposite of what we've been doing. Now we're going to look at our graph and see if we can make the equation in vertex form. So the first thing we're always going to do is we're going to look for the vertex of our graph. Um, so here I can see that our vertex is at negative 3, 6. And again, I know that's going to be my h and k values. Another thing that I recommend always doing, I recommend just writing out the vertex form before you plug any numbers in. So I'm going to substitute, again, this is my h value and this is my k value. So we have y equals a times x plus 3 squared plus 6. But we have an issue. We need to know what this a value is. So when you're missing an a value like this, what you're going to need to do is you need to find another coordinate from your graph where you can clearly see what that coordinate is. So don't pick one that's in between where you have to estimate. Pick one that you clearly can see. So I'm going to pick this coordinate right here. Again, any coordinate that you can see is fine. I see that this coordinate is negative 1, 4. So I'm going to use this coordinate. I'm going to temporarily substitute negative 1, 4 into my equation for x and y. So instead of y, I'm going to put 4 equals a times, and then instead of x, I'm going to put negative 1. Negative 1 plus 3 squared plus 6. And you can see by doing this, I am now able to solve for a. Um, so let's simplify. Here I have a times 2 squared plus 6. 4 equals 4a plus 6. And then I'm going to subtract 6. And then I will divide by 2 and simplify. So a equals negative 1 half. So now the last thing I need to do is substitute that a value back into my function. And I get y equals negative 1 half times x plus 3 squared plus 6. So remember, substituting the negative 1, 4 was just a temporary thing so we can find our a value. And there you go. All right, I have one last problem for you to try on your own, so please pause the video and give it a shot. Okay, go ahead and check your work here. Um, so I see that my vertex is 1, negative 4, so h is 1 and k is negative 4. So that gives me y equals a times x minus 1 squared minus 4. And then I need to substitute a point that I know to help me solve for a. I substitute the point to negative 1. You could have also used the point uh, 0, negative 1, and you would have gotten the same exact a value, giving you this same function. All right, that is all for today's video. Thank you so much for watching.